nice to see everybody. Um, here we are. This is the sort of thing that in the past we might have done in person, but of course in the brave new world of COVID-19, we're doing these uh, online and of course using the technology that that we very much in the TMT group look at regulating. So it's probably appropriate that we use the technology to discuss how we regulate it. Now, of course, uh, that's the way a lot of our classes will also be done for the next little while uh, until we can all reconvene safely in the classroom in London. Now, this afternoon, we are going to present a, a little bit of a, a taste or give you a little bit of a feel for what it's like to come to one of our classes. Typically what happens is um, I'd say something and then uh, explain why I think that and why I'm right and then Julia will come in with a completely different view and say that's nonsense and this is why I'm wrong and she's right and then we get a very interesting discussion happening and we thought today we'd begin to give you a a little bit of a flavour as to how that operates by looking at a particular issue that Julia and I have both been looking at for longer than either of us care to remember. I, my personal interest in regulating the internet in general goes back to my, my postgraduate dissertation in 1998. Uh, probably before some of you were born, I should point out, so you know your youth sickens me. But uh, I started with that, and then in 1999, when we had the first case, the first legal decision in the UK on regulating internet service providers' responsibility for third-party content uploaded to their servers, that's when I really got into an issue that I'd like to talk about now particularly. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this for a little while and then uh, when Julia pops up she will be uh, telling us how, uh, well what, what she thinks in due course and, and we'll see uh, until Julia gets here maybe after I've talked uh, we might take a few questions we'll see, uh, see how we go. So I'm just going to move to the screen sharing option on this lovely Zoom facility. And there we are. So you should be able to see me in the uh, up in the corner. Hi. And uh, I'm sharing my PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to see. Uh, no, I, I don't know if I could see the, the chat facility at the same time. But um, if there are any questions during the presentation or we, we put them up in the chat and we'll maybe look at that afterwards. Otherwise, hold fire and we'll see when we get through to an open discussion towards the end. Now, where I would like to start today is with this. This is a story you'll remember from childhood. And I'm going to present this as a story about how we police the internet. So you'll remember the story, Goldilocks, is a young juvenile delinquent who goes through to uh, through the woods one day, finds a nice little house, breaks in, and she finds that uh, the true residents of the house have left some food behind. So she eats all their food, and she you know, even wastes two bowls before she gets to the one that meets her taste. Then she sits in all their chairs, and then she tries all their beds, and of course. Uh, when the true occupants of the house return, they discover her asleep in the baby bear's bed, and of course they tear her to shreds and eat her entrails because they're wild animals. Now, there are all sorts of ways we could use this story as uh, an allegory for various legal processes. If this was a criminal law class specifically, we might be thinking about what right the bears as homeowners have to use violence as a defensive response to an interloper who's broken into their house. But where I want to think about this today is Goldilocks's search for the just right option. You know, she tries Father Bear's 
porridge is too salty, his chair is too hard, his bed is too hard, mother bears, things are all too sweet, too soft, too easy, and baby bear is just right. And I'm suggesting, if you like, that what we're doing when we're looking for the right way of policing the internet is the way that is just right, where the, the perfect solution and Maybe that's an illusion as well. We'll talk about that notion of an ideal solution uh, in due course. Now, freedom of expression, fairly standard concept. I did quite a lot of research on this some years ago. And as you might expect, I discovered that everybody all over the world says, freedom of expression, hurrah, isn't it great? And, you know, we see a freedom of expression provision in the well, bottom left on my screen, the First Amendment. Of course, the most famous free expression provision globally, probably. In the bottom right, we've got the, uh, the original text of the Convention on Human Rights from the Council of Europe. Uh, top right, Article 19 from the... Obviously, Article 19 is in the, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. The top middle, Constitution of the People's Republic of China, the Irish Constitution on the left, everywhere which has some kind of constitutional require, uh, record of an idea of rights, they by and large all say, freedom of expression, hurrah, isn't it great? Now, obviously, the other thing that they all do is they all also say, but hang on a minute, lads, let's not get carried away. There are reasonable limits. And those reasonable limits are what we think about as unacceptable content. Now, the exact nature of the content, which is unacceptable, will vary from state to state, country to country, depending on culture, predominant religion or ideas of ethics, uh, political culture, the nature of the, the type of state, whether it's a one-party state or whatever. But there's a wide range of possibilities, but essentially every state says there is certain content which is unacceptable. And the... Uh, oh, hello, Julia. Julia, you hear me? Hi. All right, Julia's made it online, so um, she... I, I can hear you. Thanks, Gavin. Start telling me I'm full of nonsense now. Uh, so, so there's lots of different types of content that we might decide is unacceptable. But I want to think about this on a higher level. If we put aside for a bit the idea of the content, that, you know, what is it that's unacceptable, and just think about it as stuff we won't allow how do we do that? How do we limit the stuff we won't allow online? Now, one of the very early uh, things that we discovered, of course, in regulating the internet in the olden days was the notion of the cyberspace fallacy, the idea that the internet was a separate space with no laws. The reality is it's the most over-regulated space there is because everybody wants their law to apply to it. And the problem isn't so much creating laws that can apply to the internet, but managing to enforce our laws. Yeah, with civil liability, we can figure out who we sue for defamation and where, and have they got assets there we can claim against. But, you know, even there it's difficult with uh, criminal content. It can be even more difficult if it's not a crime where the person who uploaded it and uploaded this dreadful pornography or whatever, that's accessible in your country where it's illegal, might not be illegal where they are. That's assuming you can find them. So this idea of how do we regulate the internet starts to become, well, who do we regulate? What's the point in the network where we can regulate it so that this network, which remember was designed by its very nature to be decentralized so that you can't take one point out and stop it working, who do we regulate? Where do we go for? So we could go after the source of the, the problem. That might be difficult for technical reasons, finding them, identifying them. There might be practical problems with that because of differences in laws 
and rules which make it impossible to extradite somebody, even if we know who they are. So what about the flip side? Why don't we regulate a point of receipt? Now that's largely where laws like the criminal offence in the UK on possessing what's called extreme pornography come from. Uh, the idea that, well, if you can't get the source, you go after the people, you criminalise receiving it, so you kill its market. Well, that's possible, but it's a bit going after the hydra heads rather than the body. Every time you cut one down, there's still more people getting it. You can't keep up with it. And obviously, this then leads us to think about the very nature of the online publishing model. Offline, there's a very easy distinction where we can say, you know, well, these people are a publisher. They're making that stuff available. They know what it is. Responsibility. Online, regulating the service provider becomes a challenge because they, you know, they're, yes, they're publishing. They're making stuff available, but it's somebody else put it up onto their system. Somebody else put that unacceptable content up on there. So that that's a slightly different model. We need to think about that. Of course, on the plus side, the service provider is identifiable. They are in a position to control content that they make available, albeit that that's retrospective because somebody has already uploaded it. So we're talking about taking it back in rather than stopping it getting out in the first place. Um, to some extent, we can consider the idea of the intermediary as an agent of the state, either directly or indirectly through various legal obligations to control certain uh, materials. And then, of course, we get into an argument that I will pick apart to some extent in the discussion about efficiency and what's practical against what well, is it fair which can also often spiral into economic arguments. Uh, for example, in the US, and that's a point I'll return to. So back to the idea of our three bears, you know, whose approach is right, or is there a just right approach? So we've got what I would consider the, the father bear approach, the, the hard touch, the approach where the, there's either direct or indirect state involvement with the service provider. So in China, for example, all service providers are licensed by the state. And as a condition of that, they have to prevent certain content being made available. Not massively unlike broadcasters in the UK, the BBC or whatever, although of course they're primarily only dealing with their own content. So that's much easier. Could that happen here in a liberal Western society with a different approach to national security and so on? Well, the BT clean feed system, which uh, is used by all major ISPs in the UK to block certain information, uh, websites on a blacklist provided by the Internet Watch Foundation, primarily aimed at child pornography, also now to some extent hate speech and uh, extreme pornography. But the question there then comes up, well, who decides what's unacceptable? The I've had rise over the years of the Internet Watch Foundation because they're quite touchy about this sometimes. I have my concerns that that's a system that could be open to abuse because you've got a body, a private body deciding, well, we think this is illegal rather than something that a court or a, an official lawmaking body have said, yeah, that's a no. So there's, there's a question there. And of course, then we get into the idea of the online harms white paper that, uh, and the bill to follow, which I think Julia will uh, say a bit more about, which really intends to put responsibilities on service providers to have a duty of care towards clients in some extent, within, within some parameters. But the harms that they list as things they want to stop include a lot of material which is actually perfectly lawful at the minute. And I have concerns about the idea uh, of saying, you know, if something's important enough to get a service provider into trouble because somebody else spreads it, maybe we should start by criminalizing it. Or, you know, should somebody get in trouble for something that's perfectly lawful for the the original person to express. 
I have my concerns about that. Then the other extreme, of course, the mother bear soft touch in the US. Um, for example, the Communications Decency Act has effectively immunized ISPs from almost all liability, certainly all civil liability uh, in relation to third party content. Historically, that was because they were being encouraged to actively limit pornography, but the Supreme Court in various cases has confirmed that that was unconstitutional because indecent speech is still free speech if it's legal for adults. And uh, the various um, courts have applied that to anybody who deals with third party information, right down to somebody who runs a non commercial emailing list. Now, there's the obvious freedom of speech argument there. The other argument that looms large in the US here is the idea of commercial speech. Because although commercial speech under the Constitution doesn't have the same level of protection, as political speech or other forms of free speech, it is still recognized as a form of free speech in a way that simply making money is not seen as a free speech issue uh, for the Council of Europe and the uh, interpretation of Article 10, for example. Uh, but in the US, this commercial argument, this idea is very powerful that if you make it difficult for people to run a business, they'll just drop off and not do the business and then you lose out on that innovation. So there is a question as to, you know, is there a just right option? Is it the European approach uh, with the Electronic Commerce Directive, which is 2000, the UK regulations were brought in in 2002, where we have a sliding scale of potential liability against potential control. If you host, you're more likely to be liable than if you just cash something. Um, the idea of, you know, to what extent should an intermediary face obligations for bad stuff they do make available and to what extent do we give them, like the US does, a bit of a get out of jail free card where there are many cases where they simply relied on the CDA knowing that they are making unlawful material available but they just go, well, we don't have to care, we're not liable. Now, of course, the problem with the this middle way, if you like, that Europe has taken, where it's based on a level of, you know, well, is it fair to hold them responsible in the circumstances? There is a problem of accountability. Sometimes we're making the service provider make a decision whether something's unlawful or not, because if they don't take it down, they might get into trouble for it later on. So that's an ongoing difficulty. Um, and there are also, the, again, this commercial question. Does regulation stunt the development of business? Does it discourage ISPs from developing added value services that they can bolt on? And then, of course, we have the shifting model about what a service provider is, where you know we're not only talking any longer about uh, somebody who gives you space like Amazon Web Services and says, put your website there, but it's just like, you know, renting, uh, renting a spot in a campsite to put your caravan or your camper van on for the night. Uh, but it's up to you to make sure that your camper van obeys all the laws of the road and in terms of, you know, it's got its MOT and all that kind of thing. Here we're thinking about, um, I mean, are you, sorry to interrupt you. Um, are you okay? Another five minutes? Just watching yep, the yep. clock. I'm just yeah. about to wind up now. So, uh, so, you know, we're thinking about um, things like Facebook, where there's a much greater degree of direct involvement between Facebook, where Facebook, of course, you could say all intermediaries ultimately in some way make money off of their users. But Facebook in particular have made a lot of money by selling our personal data to people like Cambridge Analytica um, or, you know, those sorts of things. So, you know, should they face more responsibility because they're, encouraging us in they're using us there's a much more of a direct relationship than a sort of passive host i think that's probably a fair argument my 
ongoing concern with that simply is comes back to well where do we draw the line and i am concerned about pushing to make uh, uh, intermediaries responsible for content that's perfectly legal in a sense so you know i raise the question is there a baby bear is there a perfect answer i think there are difficult decisions that have got to be made and we can't just harp on about free expression absent the article 10 to yeah but wait a minute there have to be reasonable limits side of things we've got to draw a line between things i wonder about this idea prescribed by law which is uh, you know they've got the legal limits have to be clear in the law how do we interpret that you know is it really prescribed by law in the way that the framers of the achr intended if they're going to say well you know sorry facebook you know it's perfectly legal for that person to post that message but you're in trouble for making it available that doesn't quite sit right with me um and of course we also uh, another big question in this area which we could go on about for days is the public private dichotomy where increasingly the old idea of drawing a line between where there was control in the private space and where there was control in the public has broken down because facebook is our public square now and yet it's a privately owned space so there are there are wheels within wheels and i think the more you get into this discussion the more questions it raises and that's well that's what being an academic is about really is answering a question with another question a lot of the time so i'm going to leave it there and let julia uh, present what she is other than to say that uh, my feeling is sometimes when it comes to these issues we've just got to do our best because we are like the uh, the proverbial blind man in the, the dark room looking for a black cat that may or may not be there in terms of looking for a perfect answer so the baby bear may be illusory and i leave it there and i will hand over to julia Thank you, Gavin. Um, just give me a second. I guess I need to share my screen, don't I? Uh, hold on. Share screen. There we go. Here are my slides. Did that work? You are screen sharing, it says. Gavin, can you see my screen? Okay, it seems to be working, so I go on presentation mode. So first of all, a very warm welcome and hello to everyone who has joined us today. So for the slightly late start, we had a technical problem. Um, I have at the moment our neighbours are doing some building work. So I had a bit of a panic because I thought, gosh, there'd be so much noise and I had to get my headphones. Um, but I think it seems to be working. So please feel free to interrupt me at any point if you like, um, preferably by switching on your audio, unmuting yourself and shouting into the classroom. So feel free to uh, interrupt me at any point. Um, so just really to say that this lecture today is sort of similar to the one we do for our LLM, LLM module. Uh, illegal speech sensor. So if you want the book to the film, that's the one to go for. Um, also, I discuss this issue of policing the internet in on the Turkish television uh, broadcasters round table policing the internet. And um, there was, I think, four or five panelists. Um, and, and as you will see, we had a really good time because we had an agent provocateur on the table who asked uh, us questions which got us riled. So I hope you can enjoy that program. The link is down there. Okay, I mean, I only have 10, 15 minutes, so obviously I can't do a full lecture, but I think the two issues I want you to think about or hopefully engage you with, and that first issue is this. It, at the beginning of the, this millennium, I guess, and around 2000, the prevailing view was that all uh, social media providers, internet service providers, should have largely immunity for the content they host because lack of control. So this is really similar to what Gavin talked about, and the extent of that immunity or the extent of their liability. 
But now, in the 2010s and now in 2020, the debate has moved on. So we're now actually moving from a system from intermediary immunity to a system of gatekeeper responsibility. So that's the theme of this lecture, which I'll talk about uh, uh, more. And the second thing to think about is the distinction between regulation by law, so the criminal law, and regulation by the platforms and the social media providers themselves, so-called self-regulation. So there are rules and policies. Now you could say self-regulation in some ways is more flexible because you don't base it on one national law because obviously the national laws are all different. Um, but the downside is that this is extra legal. And as I will hopefully make clear at the end of this lecture or this, this brief sort of overview, is that they have their own interests and they have political power. So what about democracy? Shouldn't we be in charge of our own laws? Or is it the social media companies who are now in charge of what can and cannot be seen online? So those are the two main themes, I think. So this move from intermediary immunity to gatekeeper responsibility and secondly the difference between regulation by the state and regulation uh, through the platforms. This is really just by way of background so I won't go into detail really but uh, I think Gavin already touched on this as well. So in the European Union and the UK still is part of the European Union although not for very long we have basically a, an immunity regime, which is Julia, modeled sorry. on... I'm going to interrupt you. Technically, we've left, but we're still subject to the rules until the end of the year. That's All right, at. all right. <laughs> uh, it's mad. Okay. You know? It's a mad, mad, but it's not part of this lecture, really. So, um, Article 12, so the one feature of the European uh, immunity regime, it makes a distinction between internet access providers. So those are basically our providers who provide us with internet connectivity. And there's kind of absolute immunity uh, in a sense that where the access provider does not control the content, they don't have to scan content or take things down. Well, they can't. So the idea is that the access provider is like a common carrier and they're largely immune from liability. However, they have to comply with a specific order by an administrative court or administrative body or a court to block certain types of content. And that has created all sorts of questions as to what is a specific order. But anyway, that's also not really part of, of this lecture. Article 14, by contrast, is about those internet service providers, including social media companies and platforms, with which host, in particular, user-generated content. Now, when you think about it, they can't control this content as such, because it's user-generated, obviously. But of course, they have a degree of control in the sense that they can th take things down. So the prevailing system of regulation still is to this day the idea that unless a service provider has actual knowledge of activity or is apparent from all the circumstances, they do not have to take content down. But if they have such knowledge, they have to act swiftly and take content down. So it's a notice and take down system. So anyone, including you and me, we can give notice to Facebook or YouTube or whatever, say there's illegal content, and that then potentially imputes that social media company with liability for the content. So it's a partial immunity um, system based on knowledge, and it basically requires them to take illegal content down after notification. So that is basically the prevailing system of content regulation at the moment. And there are various cases which obviously, again, in the shortness of time, I haven't really got time to go through, but just to really point out that the first three, three cases, Benjamin which is the English court, uh, Scarlet, which was the European Court of Justice, and Ahmed Yildirim in Turkey, which is the European Human Rights Court, the European Court of Human Rights, all three of them have clearly said 
that access providers are immune from liability for the very reason that they are basically just a pipe through which content flows. Now, interesting is the case of Delphi. And the picture you see on the slide, hopefully you can see it's been quite small, is it, this is a particular Estonian uh, institution where obviously in Estonia the sea freezes in the winter. The point where, and I didn't know that, that you can actually drive on it. So to those outlying islands in Estonia, in the winter they create so-called ice roads where people just take their car across the sea and they drive to that island. Now, how is that um, relevant to, to internet content regulation? Well, there was this uh, shipping company who destroyed the ice roads so that they can obviously make a profit, people still have to take the ship. And this was then negatively reported on a, on a newspaper, there was an article about it, and people posted all sorts of vitriolic abuse against the owner of the shipping company, including racist slurs um, and anti-Semitic slurs. And uh, there was then a complaint, and Delphi, which is basically a, a sort of news hosting site where, where these comments have ta taken place, took the content down, but, the, uh, but was nevertheless fined by the Estonian Criminal Court on the basis that they have participated in a criminal slander or criminal defamation. Um, and therefore, this, they went all the way to the U European Court of Human Rights, and the court actually agreed. Now, they didn't obviously base this decision on the European law in terms of the EU law and, and the hosting immunity, but on Estonian law. But interestingly enough, the court found that Delphi was actually liable to pay a fine. So no immunity in this, in this particular case. This was in a very, very similar case, interesting enough, the same court, the European Court of Human Rights in MT versus Hungary, came to the opposite conclusion by saying this, if a newspaper site is liable for the comments, and obviously they can't monitor all of them, then basically it means that the whole comment section has to be closed down, and that is an infringement of the freedom to write, uh, freedom of speech, which is basically disproportionate. That was MTE and Hungary. The last three cases concern more the question of what should a hosting provider do, such as a social media company? So in L'Oreal and eBay, we have trademark infringing hostings on eBay for the sale, I think, of Rolex. Uh, sorry, L'Oreal was L'Oreal, uh, the, the cosmetic company. So similar case concerning Rolex uh, watches. Sorry, I'm confusing the two. And here the court basically said, not only does eBay have to take down these trademark infringing sales of L'Oreal cosmetics, it also has to monitor for future similar sales and take them down. So not only retroactively in the sense once there is an illegal sale and they have to take it down, but also prospectively in the sense they have to uh, monitor for similar infringements in the future. So the court said that an injunction which imposes such an obligation on eBay as hosting provider is actually in accordance with the e-commerce directive. And in Eva Klavschnik Picek, she's pictured here on the slide, she's an Austrian politician of the Green Party, I think. And she was sort of defamed online. There was a horrible comment made about her on Facebook. She then tried to achieve injunction, not only to force Facebook to take these comments down, which obviously Facebook did, but actually in addition, a worldwide injunction to take down similar disparaging defamatory comments. And the court basically said that that is in accordance again with the e-commerce directive. So a worldwide injunction against future similar uh, content. Then the final development of 2017, which is now obviously in force of German uh, internet enforcement uh, law. Now, takedown was very haphazard. And what the German law basically does, it imposes a, a system of obligations on social media companies, only those social media companies with more than 2 million users. 
they have to basically get a certain uh, deadlines uh, they have to comply with, they have to train the people who take content down. So it imposes all sorts of specific obligations for notice and takedown. So basically in Europe, including the UK, we have a system where yes, hosting providers, such as social media companies, they have a degree of immunity if they have no knowledge of illegal content. However, as soon as they are notified of illegal content, they have to take it down. Not only do they have to take it down, they also have to monitor for future similar infringements. So in the area of trademark infringements, that means you know, the same trademark being infringed by counterfeit goods in relation to this defamation of a politician that similar defamatory comments are not posted uh, again. And that in itself has been hugely controversial because it puts the social media provider in a kind of monitoring role. Now the US has a completely different approach which is partly informed of course by this notion of freedom of speech and, uh, and the First Amendment of the US Constitution. So the uh, Communications Decency Act, paragraph 230C1, basically says, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher. So in other words, they're not responsible of information as long as that information is provided by someone else, such as user-generated content. So basically, the uh, upshot of all of this is there is complete immunity for internet access and for hosting providers in terms of civil liability. So there's no immunity obviously from the federal criminal law. And in a, in a range of cases, this has been confirmed in relation to defamation. Um, and this is something I think Gavin, you have written about in, in your article, which you mentioned. Okay, so what's the problem, right? In, in you know, well, what type of content are we actually concerned about? Now, this is a list as it appears in the online hands right paper. So basically, as we all are aware, I guess, I'm sure you are aware, there are all sorts of evil, perhaps I should say that in inverted commas, because uh, this is obviously not a technical expression. Um, and so the, there is a problem in other words, and I think especially in during the COVID-19 crisis, we've all experienced the extreme spread of misinformation, which is one of the points I make here, which in a way has then, in a way, the effect, a doubling effect, if you want, because that then incites people to uh, violent um, disinformation to extreme political views, leading them up, you know, if you think of the current protests in the US and the real division of society and the lack of social cohesion. So this is, I think, a real problem for all societies, no matter where you stand, uh, you know, what's, uh, where you stand on in respect of freedom of expression. Um, I think new technologies, when I say new, remember, I mean, Remember Facebook, I think, appeared only in 2005. This is really a problem of the last 10, 15 years. Then, you know, they introduced live streaming, for example, only a few years ago. You all remember this terrible, terrible time when the atrocities, uh, the terrorist atrocities happened on the two mosques in New Zealand with, with the shooting and the terrorists actually live streaming this as it was happening. Um, and then obviously Facebook took tried to take it down as quickly as possible, but by the time it was taken down, it had already been passed on to all sorts of other sites. So the, this raises, I think, severe questions of whether the current notice and take down system is still working. Um, so moving on now to a system which is based on this idea and gavin you, you mentioned this that actually service providers are gatekeepers for regulators now what is gatekeeper regulation this is actually a term which has been used more generally in, in respect of mass media and editorial content control so gatekeepers essentially literally are those entities uh, which decide who shall pass through the gate, what type of content can we see. Obviously, in a traditional media context, say broadcasting, clearly the broadcaster has a license, they're responsible for controlling, in terms of editorial control, the kind of content we see. 
Now, of course, the internet has been celebrated for the very reason that there is no editorial control. And everyone, you know, you and me, we can become publishers without an editor standing in our way. So in some ways, by reinventing a gatekeeper regulation system onto the internet, we are in a way moving back, you could say, from this whole idea that users can post and interact in whatever way they like. And therein lies, I think, the very conflict of internet content regulation. So in some ways you could say, well, think of YouTube, think of Instagram, think of all these different social media platforms. They have control and they haven't. They, have, they haven't got control, of course, in the sense that they uh, control each post. The whole point is that this is an interactive service. But they have some control in the sense that they, of course, organize the information, they organize how we interact. So local intermediaries as gatekeepers, in a way, become the linchpin for regulation. And I think where this notion started it was an early case, the Rolex case uh, I was referring to earlier, Ricardo Rolex. Ricardo, I think, was the same as eBay in Germany in the early days of the internet. So it was an online auction where someone was selling counterfeit Rolex watches. And here, the, um, the, the trademark holder didn't just want that they take these, these Rolex watches down because the problem is counterfeit goods, of course, is you know you take one down and 500 new ones appear. So it's very difficult for the um, IP right holder to actually keep up to date with, with all the counterfeit sales. So they wanted a system where the, uh, the auction provider has the uh, function of actually monitoring their platform for other trademark infringing Rolex watch sales. Uh, and the court here in the question of whether they have to impose an injunction said, well, the uh, auction provider, of course, is not directly benefiting from the sale, although obviously they financially benefit from it, but they obviously they're not the seller. But in a way, they are mixed up in someone else's, in the seller's, in the counterfeiter's wrongdoing, and therefore they have an obligation to prevent the sale where they can. And here the court felt, well, you know, they can do keyword searches, whether something is offered as a Rolex watch. And they have various methods to prevent these illegal sales. So the court felt it's sort of reasonable to impose an obligation on the auction provider to prevent future similar illegal sales. And that concept, which has the German name of Stoerhaften, was then in a way taken up by other courts in Europe as well. And now moving on 10, 20 years, I think this is sort of slowly becoming a uh, a standard which governments and regulators try to impose on intermediaries. Um, I've written a paper on entitled gatekeeper regulation to which I link here, which kind of looks at new forms of regulation in, in various jurisdictions and how they impose a new form of regulation. But when you think it's true, okay, once content has been identified by a trademark by a court in a criminal case as illegal, then of course it may be possible to search for similar illegal content. So through keywords or to recognize certain violent images through, through hash uh, functions. But so far we have no real technology which automatically recognizes new content and is able to categorize that as legal or illegal from a, from a strictly legal point of view. You still need a judge for that function. So we're caught in, in, a, in a bit of a, a difficult situation. On the one hand, notice and take down seems to be too slow. I mean, you know, if a terrorist streams themselves doing their mass killings, notice and take down, even if it's done really quickly and efficiently, will take 24 hours at least. So that doesn't prevent our terrorists streaming their atrocious deeds. But then do we really want to automate content recognition? I mean, artificial intelligence and machine learning at the moment are not able to apply very difficult and conflicting notions of what is legal and what is illegal, say, under the criminal law. 
So this is a real conundrum, I would say. So the UK government, uh, it was the Home Secretary, Savit Javid, I think he was driving behind this. He's lost since his job, so I'm not too sure what, what, but, you know, whether that driving force is still the same. But anyway, last year, April 2019, the UK government introduced a white paper, which is the precursor to legislation with the title Online Harms, and I'll link to it here. And the idea, in my view, naively, is that the internet, whatever that is, the internet, is supposed to become the safest place. So it's all about online safety. And to my mind, the term online safety is actually an oxymoron, right? In my view, my own personal opinion, we just have to accept that the internet is not a safe place, if you can call the internet a safe place. But the, this notion of online safety, in a way, is hiding the fact that you can't regulate the internet in the same way you can regulate broadcasting. Anyway, so the UK government, in a white paper and the following consultations, wants to basically set up a regulator, we assume this will be Ofcom, which imposes a legal duty of care on all online service providers, including obviously social media companies. This will be set up by framework legislation and codes of conduct. So the codes of conduct will set out in detail how they have to deal with various types of illegal content, including obviously the notion that content has to be appropriate to the age of the audience, which is a whole other quagmire, this question of how to protect children, of course. Now, who would be subject to this system of regulation? Well, this is defined really, really widely. So the regulatory framework will apply to companies that provide services or that allow or enable facilities for users to share or discover user-generated content or interact with, with each other online. The, it's envisaged that there will be civil and criminal penalties if uh, the, the social media companies do not comply and that they might block uh, websites. And of course, an obligation on the uh, service providers to have complaints handling systems. Is it a lame duck? So a commentator in Wired said this is not going to work um, because it cannot be enforced. And if it was enforced uh, draconically, then in a way, the UK government would really disgruntle uh, the big service, online service providers and they're unlikely to do that politically. So that's the question of whether this will actually fully be and effectively uh, be enforced. Um, so one of the big issues, I think, is that manual checking of content is impossible. There is actually, um, I probably don't really have, well, I'll, I'll show you actually a video clip of um, a documentary, which I strongly recommend you watch. It's called The Cleaners, and it's basically about a Facebook Julia, I think you can see that but the system is not showing it to us. Oh, it, it's not uh, showing. Okay. Maybe the video clip is this being is... blocked for copyright reasons, and this is the point you're making about uh, blocking and control in action. Could be. I could just do something to do with bandwidth. Or Zoom, yeah, as you say, Zoom doesn't allow us to do this. Sorry. Um, anyway, there's a link here to um, a trailer. So this is no copyright infringement of a video called The Cleaners, which, which I strongly recommend. It's basically about the takedown system Facebook has employed. They employ thousands and thousands of individuals um, in, in various countries. This particular documentary talks about the, uh, the operations in the Philippines, and it interviews many of the people who work there who say that they basically have to work and have 15 hours a day, and they have to, about two seconds for each item of content in which they have to decide whether to take it down or not. And some of the employees got so depressed that they committed suicide seeing all these horrendous, horrendous footage with minimal support by Facebook. But also some of the dilemmas of what to take down and what, what, you know, what to leave on. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very good documentary. Anyway, so... The manual checking and the manual takedown, which is obviously what Facebook does and has been doing that for a number of years, and they announced last year, I think, that they double the staff of people who make these takedown decisions. 
So the practice of notice and take down, I think, is, is quite important. What does it mean? You know, how do you actually do it? Um, so the question, of course, is can this be automated through the use of artificial intelligence data mining to proactively basically figure out what content depicts, first of all. Secondly, whether it's legal or illegal. And if it's illegal, to uh, proactively filter it so it now actually is uploaded. Clearly, considering that artificial intelligence is not really able to do that, I think this is again a sort of technology hybris. We haven't got the tools to actually do this successfully. So it clashes freedom of expression because content will be taken that will be uh, prevented from upload, which, which should go up. And other content, which perhaps is uh, illegal, will actually appear on the platform. So it's not accurate, this type of technology. But then more importantly, can artificial intelligence ever recognize the subtleties of irony, satire, humor, or parody? And then even, even more fundamental, I think, is that the, not necessarily the most violent posts are the most dangerous. So if you think in terms of, say, um, terrorist content, you know, the sort of things which entice young people to join or commit terrorist uh, atrocity, it's not necessarily violent content. It's stuff which persuades them to, to have a particular ideology, but not necessarily something which is on the face of it by purely just looking at it is violent. Um, I, I'll go over that because of time. Another instrument which I think to my mind shows this um, progression from question of immunity to gatekeeper regulation is the audiovisual media services directive. So this is again a European piece of legislation from 2018. And it initially just focused on self-regulation, co-regulation of video sharing platforms. So this only applies to video sharing platforms such as YouTube. And initially it was all about industry self-regulation, flagging systems, age verification, complaints handling, and then it introduced uh, at the very, very last stage of when the directive was going through the process of being passed, that four types of content must be regulated by law. So this is of the terrorists' uh, incitement, public provocation to commit a terrorist offence, child pornography, so child uh, abuse, then expressions of racism and xenophobia, and incitement of violence of hatred against the protected group. So in, interesting enough, we, again, here we see a mixed approach of regulation by law, where basically uh, the, there must be some sort of legal system and self-regulation through the uh, social media companies themselves. This raises the question, though, can we rely on self-regulation? First of all, and this is, I guess, more of a political point, it requires good faith of the social media companies themselves. Now, if you think of the big tech companies, you know, Facebook, Instagram, or Google, YouTube, they have so much power, but unlike governments, they're not elected. So, you know, are we really happy for them to be in charge of content? What's worse, governments being in charge of content in terms of the criminal law, or social media companies being in charge of content in terms of their terms and conditions. So two examples have gone through the news um, in this June. Well, first of all, you remember that President Trump, Trump refused to take down, um, so Twitter refused to take down President Trump's comments uh, following the recent protests where he, I think, I think what he said was uh, first the looting, then the shooting, which referred to some sort of uh, violent um, atrocities, I think in the 1960s. Twitter took it down and Trump then complained, you remember the debate, and um, Facebook refused to take them down. And in this link, which I post here, Zuckerberg justifies why he has decided not to take them down. Similarly, there is now this uh, 
Boogaloo movement in the US, which is basically a far right uh, movement for, of those people who want the right to carry weapons and who fight against any type of government interference, including, of course, any restrictions to do with COVID-19 because the ability is restricted. And also a lot of them obviously are white supremacists who believe in a sort of separate white state of, uh, and, and and, and this turn, I think this has the potential to turn into more and more violent confrontations in the US. Facebook initially again refused to take their content down and only very recently has decided to take it down. So again, there is a sort of debate going on here. So self-regulation is good in the sense that it is more global. I think the problem with national regulation, of course, again, is jurisdiction. The problem that the laws and regulations of countries differ and every country has different laws and different regulations, but the internet is global. But the problem I think with self-regulation is that it means government by very, very powerful tech companies, which is not in any way democratic or controlled by, by the people either. So it's not necessarily superior to the notion of uh, government control. So I think, I hope this, um, I brought out the two themes that while the law still focuses on the immunity of social media platforms such as Facebook, in a way the debate and also the policy debate in many countries has moved on to the idea of gatekeeper regulations. So making social media companies responsible for some of the illegal interactivity on their platforms, in particular things like live streaming of, of terrorist atrocities and the outcry which kind of followed from, from the, for example, the attacks in New Zealand. I think that was 2017, wasn't it? And then the debate between co and self-regulation on the one hand and regulation by the law. And I think in a way this is interestingly played out now in particular with COVID-19 and this avalanche of misinformation and conspiracy theories which I think COVID-19 has engendered. And following on from that with the violent clashes we see for example in the US but also after the murder of George Floyd and, and, and the protests uh, of Black Lives Matter, which are then sort of engendered protests by uh, you know, various right-wing groups as well. So in a way we see, I think, more of a social divide as a consequence of misinformation being spread online. And that then raises even more urgent questions of how to control content online. That was a real canter through a, a very difficult and complicated topic. Um, we're here now really for questions. So I, I go out of my slides. We have uh, about five minutes before Zoom kicks us out. So there's uh, some time for um, any questions anybody has. The, this is a lot like what our classes are usually like. You know, I, I'll start off, as I said earlier, and say something and then uh, Julia will tell me why she thinks I'm wrong. And then we'll have a bit of an argument about it and, uh, and we like to get you involved as well and uh, to tell us that you don't think either of us are right or get things going. I think we may have stunned them into submission, Julia. There's a, a silence uh, there. Just, just to say there will be a recording. Um, There will certainly there be the session has been recorded. What will happen after we finish today is it's going to be edited a little bit and then it will be available via the website. Keep an eye on the mailing list and on the website you'll see it come up. Um, we'll check that we have if there are any broken links we'll uh, we'll look at adding those. Uh, there's a question about the YouTube link there Julia and um, other than that it's uh, we look forward to seeing hopefully lots of you in our, our class in September. Well, I think it's a very interesting class because we really get to grips with these sorts of issues, these sort of big questions that have a real impact in the real world. And as Julia has said throughout her presentation, you can see how even in the last few weeks since the shutdown, 
a lot of these issues are still coming up. You know, this is not something where we talk about cases that are 10 years old. This is something where every single week there will be relevant things happening in the news to what you're studying. And uh, these are big questions that will be struggled with, I think, for some time to come yet. I mean, feel really free if you have any questions, questions for the content or yeah, comments or questions about uh, the teaching or, you know. And if anybody wants to send us emails as well uh, to find out a little bit more about the course or if you have particular questions about some of these issues and, and what modules you might take that will help you explore the aspects of TMT law that you're interested in, all our email addresses are available on the website, so do please feel free to drop any of us a line and ask for more information. Uh, there's way. a question, Gavin, I'll, I'll answer that live. So the question is, what's been the core approach to actual knowledge by providers? That raises the difficult question of what is um, a notification, right? Um, so basically, once someone has notified the provider that there's illegal content, then they have notification. And then in a way it's up, to, and, and this actually is one of the difficult issues there as well. How does the provider actually figure out what is illegal or not legal? This, this can be very difficult if you think of copyright infringement or, or defamation. You know, how, how is the provider going to know whether comment is true or not? So yes, the notion of actual knowledge is problematic. Then the second question is, do you think it's true or defensible that content recognition technology is not sophisticated enough to catch illegal content and manual review not feasible? For me, a question I see that you perhaps doubt this. I mean, technology, of course, is, is actually uh, developing all, all the time. But I think at the moment, um, you know, think about it is in terms of um, is, for example, is, is technology really being able to make a distinction? For example, if you think of a violent image, is this an operation? There's lots of blood and, and there are wounds, or, or is this the, uh, uh, an image of, of a violent aftermath of, say, a terrorist attack? Well, how is technology going to recognize that? So context is one of the problems. Technology doesn't recognize context. Um, technology doesn't recognize irony. They might figure out the meaning in terms of the literal meaning, but not in a way the, the contextual meaning or, or um, so I think it's wishful thinking to think, oh yeah, technology will solve that. Maybe it will solve it in about 50 years, but certainly not now. That's my view. I think that, that's one we actually very much agree on that uh, technology is not yet a substitute for human decisions on very subtle and nuanced situations. So we lawyers will have a job for some years to come yet. What happens in 50 <laughs> years? I'll be gone by then, I don't care. Uh, no, maybe that's not fair, but but yeah, um, I agree with Julie on that. I think- uh, yeah, Thank you for at, your question, it's good. But looking at uh, our time, it's, uh, it's just come time for us to hit the buffers on our Zoom session. So, it's time to wind up, but thank you very much for coming along. I hope you've gained some level of insight into how we teach. Uh, I hope we've made you think about some interesting issues that obviously are things we explore as our course goes on. And we look forward to seeing you all at least online in September and hopefully all together, hopefully uh, before the year is out, and we'll be able to actually meet in person, COVID-19 willing. So we'll, uh, we'll wind up for there. Well, uh, yeah, we'll obviously do a, a mixture of, of, of online teaching yeah. and maybe some other events if, if, you know, if it's safe enough to do and, and possible. So for those of you coming to London either in September or in, in January, you know, that, that, there'll be live interaction as well as online interaction. So. And so just to, uh, so that nobody is left wondering, okay, you know, this whole polite dance of nobody wants to be the first person to switch the session off. I believe I am <laughs> logged in as the session host. And so I'll switch it off for all That's of us. That's it, Gavin. You, you have to do on. it. You have to do it. I can't do it. No. <laughs>
Thank you for coming. Great to see you. Thank you so much for coming.